Um, greetings, good morning. Uh, my name is John Mark Walker. I'm the Gluster Community Leader. Uh, I work for Red Hat. Uh, with me is Eric Carney. He's one of the uh, OpenStack engineers, also works for Red Hat. Um, we're gonna talk today about different ways that uh, GlusterFS uh, can be uh, integrated with OpenStack. We've done a lot of work in the last year, especially, uh, on integrating with all the different uh, storage interfaces with, with, with OpenStack, uh, from Swift to Cinder to Glance. We're gonna go through what we've done on all of those interfaces, in addition to uh, giving you a little bit of a heads up on, a, on some of the roadmap uh, that we're working on roadmap around uh, the Manila project and Savannah specifically. Uh, we've done a lot of work, we're really happy with the results so far, and so we wanted to share that with you, talk about uh, how it's being used today, and what you can do with it, and also I'll give you an example of uh, a real world use case of someone who's using uh, some stuff in production. So, uh, with that being said, um, when we started out about, oh, so many years ago in 2006, uh, we had the, the idea that uh, where we came across a lot of different storage solutions that were complex, costly, uh, black box, proprietary solutions sold by you know, vendors who built complexity into their business model so that they could you know, charge more money and, and, and keep you locked into their solution. And we wanted to do away with all of that. We wanted, we thought you know, storage should be just like any other application you install in the data center. It should be easy to use, easy to manage, and if you need to, easy to get rid of without destroying your data. If you look at the past 10 to 15 years, uh, the storage market has kind of been lagging the rest of the, the market, because the rest of the market, especially on the compute side, has been going all virtualized, all abstracted away from the hardware, uh, all sort of redundant in software solutions, whereas storage kind of took a while to get to that point. And it took a while to get to that point because for very good reason, uh, nobody wants to destroy their data. Uh, virtualization of storage is a scary concept when you're thinking about all the petabytes of data that you have that you don't want to lose. So that's how we, um, that was our starting point. And over the years, we've we built out GlossRFS to be uh, you know, an easy to use and install, manage, um, distributed file system uh, that could do, was great for scale out file system storage, for file sharing, essentially. Uh, and over the years, and especially in the last two years, we've been adding to that. So not only is it a scale out NAS solution, uh, but it's also something you can use for virtual block storage with the, uh, thanks to the KVM integration that, that we've done. Um, it's something you can use for object storage, thanks to the Swift integration that we've done. Um, so there, there are lots of things that we've added to the mix now, and I wanted to make sure that uh, everyone was aware of the work that we've been doing and how you can use it. When you think about our core design principles, there are three key ones that, uh, that we follow uh, when, we, when we do anything in GlusterFS. Uh, two of those have been with us since the beginning, and one is fairly recent. When you think about no data silos, I mean, we always had the concept of a global namespace or being able to present um, a cluster volume to, to many different clients. But the idea of no data silos really came about with the addition of multi-protocol support. Up until two years ago, we were exclusively a POSIX compliant shop. It was all about NFS, uh, a cluster FS client was, a, was POSIX compliant. And I think actually after a couple of years was, was when we added the NFS v3 support. So it was, it was all POSIX based. That was, everything was a file. Uh, from top to bottom, from server to client, everything was a file and treated as a file, and everything was POSIX. And then in the last two years, we added more to the mix. We did the Swift integration. We've done uh, Hadoop HDFS integration. We've done uh, the QM integration for, for virtual block storage. We've done all these different things, but we kept the idea that everything should be a global namespace. Everything should be uh, available to all the different avenues of access that you have, and they shouldn't be siloed from each other. It's a, one of our very key design principles that we follow now. Um, the other design principle was no single point of failure. Again, when we first started back in 2006, we realized that a lot of solutions had uh, a metadata server. And we thought, and at first we kind of tried to mimic that, and we realized that it kind of got in the way. It, um, uh, there were two reasons. One is it could limit the, uh, the, the scalability, because once you scale it beyond a certain point, metadata servers would tend to fall over, uh, or at least lose some of their performance or reliability. Um, but also because uh, metadata servers were a single point of failure. And we wanted to have an architecture that didn't have a single point of failure, a share nothing architecture where that was redundant and consistent uh, and, and reliable. And then the third principle we follow is the global namespace. That is, no matter where you deploy GlusterFS, whether it's uh, in a public cloud, on AWS, or on a, uh, an OpenStack cloud, or on a, 
a virtualized environment, on, on, the, on the guests of a virtualized environment, or on the bare metal system. Um, it should look the same and behave the same no matter how you're interacting with it. And every application you use to access it should be able to access the, the global namespace from multiple methods uh, and, and access the same data. So. At our core, um, we're a unified distributed storage system, uh, user space. We don't have any kernel space uh, technology except for uh, on the client side, we do integrate with the, um, uh, the Fuse kernel module, and that's how, we do, um, that's how we mount a file system over a network using the GlustFS client. Um, but other than that piece, we're, we're, uh, we're strictly user space. Uh, stackable architecture, uh, we borrowed a lot of design terminology as well as the design, design architecture from the GNU Herd project. How many of you have heard of GNU Herd? Okay, cool. Um, so one of the contributors to the GNU Herd project was the co-founder of the Gluster project and the, of Gluster Incorporated, A.D. Periosamy. And so he borrowed a lot of the, the terminology and, and the architecture. Um, so we have uh, stackable user space uh, translators where all of our features are implemented. Um, and then ultimately everything is treated as a file. GlusterFS serves as an overlay, an aggregator that sits on top of disk, disk file systems. And those disk file systems uh, are anything that supports extended attributes. So they could be ext4, xfs, butterfs, um, and, and almost exclusively on Linux, but anything that supports the extended attributes. Uh, we also have a maintainer who, who keeps our uh, ports for NetBSD going, and so it is a, a portable architecture, but I think pretty much everyone uses Linux these days. So it's kind of, you know, we're kind of in the process of going through, uh, you know, adding uh, functionality to GlusterFS that we didn't have before. And as we do this and as we approach the, the cloud storage market, we're realizing that you know, some people tried to use GlusterFS for things that maybe didn't do so well a couple years ago. And as a result of that, you know, sometimes uh, there's, there's the impression that the things that we're trying to do now um, may maybe not be so good for. And in, in truth, you know, maybe a couple years ago we tried to, maybe we were a little bit too forward thinking, maybe we thought the technology could handle things that it couldn't actually do until we added new things later. Um, but in spite of that, um, we're now sort of, we have to address the, 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 uh, uh, the elephant in the room, which is the ghost of Gluster Past. And so you can see all these things I've heard at various conferences. And I just want to tell you that it's a lot different story now than it was two, three, four years ago. If you look at the differences in the project now compared to then, it's a vastly different uh, architecture, both from a governance model as well as the engineering team um, to the support you know, that came with you know, Red Hat acquiring Gluster Incorporated and adding more engineers to the mix. So the, the comparison is, is really stark, and I, I hope that this slide helps to put it in a bit more relief so that it's uh, easier to, to see that difference. Um, you know, we, we've added, you know, it, it's since the uh, Red Hat acquisition that uh, our engineers started adding you know, the multi-protocol story. It's when, uh, that's when we started moving to shorter release cycles, where we started taking a more multilateral approach when it came to recruiting developers and organizations to work with the project. Um, you know, before we were acquired, we were a, what I would call an open core project. We happened to release software under an open source license, but then since then we've, um, we've changed and we've made it uh, uh, more inclusive, more of a big tent, and to the point now where our main, um, uh, our, primary, our premier feature in the last version 3.4 uh, was contributed by IBM engineers. So, um, a slide about performance, uh, and this just serves to, to show you that, you know, we've come a long way in two years. Two years ago, I would not have been able to put this slide up. Uh, now, it says Red Hat Storage, but what it really means is, is GlusterFS. And you could have said two years ago that, you know, maybe we didn't perform so well in certain workloads, but we've spent a lot of time and effort over the last two years uh, fixing that, uh, fixing bugs, uh, making it perform better so that uh, uh, you can actually use it for a lot more things than you could before. Now, I think we know that benchmarks, you know, they're lies, damn lies, and benchmarks, or benchmarking. Uh, I can't really say for sure that, you know, every workload is going to behave like this. But I can say, and this kind of serves notice to those who, you know, kind of wanted to write us off, uh, but, um, but going forward, I think it's safe to say that, uh, you know, we're pretty competitive, and I'll, I'll leave it at that whether or not, you know, what, what kind of performance you see really depends on your workload and, and your environment and the other variables in the mix. So, but I invite you to compare it. 
I don't know. I'm sure someone will now. This kind of gives you an overview of the architecture. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna give you sort of like the, I'm gonna finish giving you kind of a bird's eye view of the project and then we're gonna go into more of the, the open and stacky goodness. Uh, but just from an architectural standpoint, um, again, you can see at, at the bottom you have your storage servers. Um, a volume encompasses multiple storage servers and a, a, in a, inside of volume are bricks and the brick in the Gluster nomenclature is uh, any file system that you export or any file system that you wanna share. Uh, so you can have multiple bricks in a volume and just like you can have multiple servers in a volume. And you present that volume over a variety of ways. Uh, you can connect to it via the GlusterFS client, which again mounts using the Fuse module. Um, about three years ago, we added the NFS v3 client, or I'm sorry, we, added, we implemented an NFS v3 server, uh, one in GlusterFS, uh, and then so NFS v3 clients can connect to it. Um, there's also NFS v4 working on, just so you know. Uh, and then LibGIF API, which is a recently released client library, and that's how we did the QMU integration, which is also how we did the Nova integration, which we'll get into. Uh, and it's how we're gonna do all future um, software stack integrations. Any questions about the architecture? Okay. And in the same vein, this kind of just gives you an overview of how things connect to each other. Um, on the uh, GlusterFS server side, you have the, the volumes that are replicated and distributed. In this particular case, we have a two-way replication uh, and we have a, uh, a volume that's distributed over two uh, servers and then, uh, uh, um, and then replicated on two more servers. And then you can see the way the, the clients connect to it. Um, the GlusterFS native client, uh, when it connects to a, a group of Gluster servers, it, uh, it downloads the, uh, the translator stack and so it can understand uh, failover and distributed, uh, distributed uh, pathways uh, from the client side. So you don't have to route everything through a single server uh, on the bottom. It can, uh, it can fail over to uh, another replica from the client. Uh, the same thing with LibGIF API. When you integrate with LibGIF API, same story. Uh, the only case where, where that doesn't apply is with the NFS v3 client because NFS v3 uh, doesn't simply, that by definition of the protocol, doesn't have that kind of support. Okay, any questions? Cool. Um, this gives you an overview of all the different possibilities that, of interfacing with GlusterFS. Uh, you can see on the file side, we've got the Fuse module that works with the client. Uh, SMB support via Samba exports with the, via a recent Samba integration. If you're using Samba version 4.1 and higher, uh, this integration is baked in. If you're using Samba 3.6, uh, we have a project on the Gluster Forge that you can uh, download the source for and, and compile in Gluster support that way. Um, HDFS, we have a plugin uh, that you can put on the uh, Hadoop server, and then uh, uh, it, uh, it implements the HDFS API, or I guess now it's called the HCFS API, Hadoop Compatible File System, um, and then the NFS piece, which I went over. Um, on the block side, we have, uh, we have an integration with Sender, and Sender, via an integration with Nova, will also work with the QMU integration, and this is how we do the virtual block storage. Uh, on the object side, we, we have a collaboration with the upstream Swift project, and we have two uh, committers to the Swift project, and uh, so we've implemented um, a pluggable architecture for Swift, so you can plug in uh, GlusterFS on the back end. Uh, and then we have the LibGIF API, uh, which is the uh, access point for all the software stacks you want to integrate with. Uh, on the transport side, uh, we features IP, IP as well as RDMA support. Um, I think with a previous release on 3.3, it wasn't necessarily the best implementation, uh, but it's significantly improved for 3.4. And we have several community members uh, or community guys uh, using GlusterFS with their uh, InfiniBand card. How many of you use InfiniBand? Okay, I, is it just me or has InfiniBand gotten really cheap over the last year? It's like, I don't know. I, I see a lot more of it popping up now. Um, and on the back end, you know, again, everything is a file ultimately, but um, it can be uh, uh, projected as something else, either a, a, a virtual block device, which you know, works with the QMU and KVM side, uh, and I think there's a DB translator somewhere, uh, although no one really uses it. Um, some of the features of GlusterFS specifically, um, there's no metadata server. Again, as I, as I mentioned, our, our developers decided to take a different route. Uh, they weren't file system experts per se, so when they approached the storage problem, uh, they had a different method of solving the scale out piece of it. And so, 
they decided to, um, that was faster, instead of having a metadata server where you route all connections to the metadata server and then to the, the data, they actually uh, uh, created uh, a solution where uh, you, you calculate a hash based on, <coughs> excuse me, a hash value based on the, the file name and the file metadata, and then you store that hash inside uh, the extended attributes of the file. That's why we only work with disk file systems that support extended attributes. Uh, and then we use that hash, we calculate that hash to both read and write the data to look up uh, the location. Um, Multi-protocol multi access, which I mentioned. Uh, replication synchronous and asynchronous. You can, uh, by default, you can replicate synchronously when you define a volume as a replica or as replicated. Uh, by default, it's synchronous. Um, but we also have an asynchronous replication piece called geo-replication. Uh, it's master-slave. And then uh, as of 3.3, .3, we feature proactive self-healing. Uh, and again, when we talk about multi-protocol access, a lot of solutions these days uh, will have or have implemented multi-protocol access, but we really have a unified storage backend that is very unique to GlusterFS. We don't believe in data silos. We think that if you store files and you store objects, you should be able to access it no matter where you're coming from. And I have a, uh, an illustration of that uh, coming up in a second. Um, how, so how do we do all this great stuff? Uh, well, it's, it's about being a, a modular architecture. When you look at that middle translator stack, you know, distribution, replication, uh, that stuff can all live on the client and the server. Um, you know, again, when you connect to a Gluster volume from the client, uh, the, the, the GlusterFS client uh, reads the, the volume definition and downloads the, the translators that are needed uh, to route the data and to, and to implement the features that, that are needed for that particular volume. Uh, so those translators can, uh, live and operate on, and have to run on both the client and the server. And so when you, when you route the data, when you look at the data path, you see how it goes through the, the client side, and then go through the different translator stacks to determine where it's replicated or distributed to, uh, and then you go through the, the RPC communication and down to the, the server side, and then on down to the, uh, the local storage on the, on the disk drive. And you know, when we say stackable, you, know, you implement features with translators, and you also remove features by removing the translator. You can remove the translator, and you can have you know, fewer features if you really don't need them. Um, or there's a great way to build translators. We have a, a really good API, a solid uh, uh, API in place for many years now for building new features with the translator API stack. What do you generally use it for? Um, lots of things. Uh, we aim for the unstructured data market and that's the one that's expanding by you know, double. It's a doubling in size every year, pretty much. Um, so all the things that you need to store that require many petabytes that uh, require you to scale out and grow as needed. Um, GlusterFS is intended to be, uh, you know, not just scale out, but easily scaled out so that you don't have to pre-allocate how much space you're gonna to devote to it if you need to add more uh, data or more space to your storage uh, piece, then you can just add more servers to the mix and expand that way. Again, we pride ourselves on the global namespace and being able to be, uh, behave the same and interact the same with all applications regardless of where they're deployed, you know, whether it's AWS, whether it's uh, an, an open stack based cloud or uh, as a, on, on guests of a hypervisor or on bare metal. It should behave the same. You should be able to consistently interact with it with your, uh, with your existing application stacks. And this, uh, shows you, again, kind of gives you a diagram of what we mean by multi-protocol access uh, and the single namespace, the global namespace, uh, and our, you know, no data silos philosophy. If you look at, at the top, you can see the, uh, the connection between the Swift client attaching to a Gluster volume, and, and when you see the, the Swift proxy box there, understand that that is the same uh, proxy server that's used by the Swift project itself. We're in collaboration with that project uh, to make that proxy server pluggable. And so we take their proxy server and then we map it out to a GlusterFS backend. And that's how we, uh, uh, that's how we implemented the Swift API support. Um, but in addition to that, when you access data via the, uh, the Swift API, you also make that data available to other connection methods, whether it's over NFS, V3, or Samba, or, uh, or some other uh, POSIX compatible way of interacting, such as you know, the GlusterFS client. Uh, or other means, it's the same data. So you can actually mount the volume over NFS and look at and interact with and manage uh, the same data that you're interacting with over the, the Swift API. 
So it's, it, it, there's a lot of value there if you need to make data available to your existing tool sets and you don't want to rewrite your applications. That's a very powerful feature. Uh, and conversely, if you have a bunch of data sitting in your, uh, in your storage, you want to make it available via the Swift API, it's fairly easy to do that as well. Uh, the same concept applies to our Hadoop integration. If you have a lot of data that you want to do, be able to do MapReduce jobs on, um, it's very easy to, uh, to now make that available to your uh, Hadoop uh, uh, cluster. Uh, or you can make it so that when you run your MapReduce jobs, it stores the data on GlusterFS servers, thus making that data available to your other analytics toolkits. Any questions? Yes. I could not tell you, but there are two engineers sitting here that can address your question after I'm done. <laughs> uh, the other thing that we've implemented, especially with 3.4, and again, this feature was uh, contributed by engineers from uh, IBM's Linux Technology Center, was the, uh, for the virtualization use case. Uh, when you talk about integration with QMU KVM, and again, this is the basis for the Nova integration, which, which came uh, as of uh, OpenStack Havana. Um, but in this case, you can now designate a Gluster, you know, a Gluster protocol, assuming you're using QMU 1.3 or higher, uh, it has support natively for the Gluster protocol, and you can uh, designate, uh, uh, you can spin up a VM that goes directly to the Gluster volume. Uh, and we're able to do this via, uh, there, are sort of, there are three layers for this integration. There's the QMU protocol support, which was contributed by IBM engineers. There's the uh, block device translator, which allows GlusterFS to present a file as a virtual block device to KVM. And then there's the libgfapi you know, client library that sits in the middle. Um, we did the client library. Uh, IBM contributed the block device translator and the uh, QMU integration. This is a very bad diagram done by one of the uh, engineers of the solution, showing you the difference between the, the standard QMU uh, stack and the, uh, the Gluster-backed uh, QMU stack. And that brings us to the, the libgfapi client library. Um, we had started this project a couple of years ago, I think with the 3.0 series of releases, uh, and then due to resource constraints, we had to sort of drop it. And then we brought it back when the QMU integration started happening, because we realized that if we're going to start seriously dealing with the use case of people managing and hosting uh, VM images on GlusterFS, we had to do something about latency. And this, and I'll show you a diagram in a minute that tells you exactly how it deals with the latency issue, but it's libgf API, uh, by using libgf API integration, it bypasses the fuse mount uh, and goes directly to the, uh, the cluster volume. Um, and so when you look at our standard client, our traditional client, and you look at the number of context switches between user space and kernel space along the data path as it goes from application to, you know, through the networking layer and then down to, um, then onto on the server side, uh, you can see I think the total number of context switches from user space to kernel space or, and, and vice versa is 14, if you count them all up. Um, in contrast, uh, now when you think of random I.O. use cases, this will kill your latency. And so for things like VM image hosting and management, it, it's a non-starter once you get beyond a certain number of VMs that you're trying to host. Uh, so that's hence the, the, uh, the libgf API solution. And in comparison, uh, when you, when you uh, integrate with libgf API, the number of context switches drops dramatically to I think, I think it's eight is the final count. So, as you can imagine, the latency uh, of this solution uh, is much better than, than previously. It doesn't mean, by the way, that the Glusterfs client is going away because there's still a need for you know, general use case file serving, just uh, general purpose mounting over a network. Um, but for particular use cases, this is the preferred method. And now we get to the good stuff. Um, OpenStack integration. So two years ago, we had just started on the Swift integration piece, and that was the only uh, OpenStack integration that we could really do or lay claim to. Um, for everything else in the OpenStack uh, realm, there were, you know, there was uh, uh, Glance, and I don't think there was Cinder at the time two years ago. But in order to interact with uh, OpenStack, you would essentially just mount the cluster volume, you know, using the Fuse module, and you would do all the interaction that way, just as another, you know, path on the, on the file system. But as I mentioned, um, due to some issues, when you tried, once you tried to scale out beyond a certain point, uh, latency would go up and it would be, you know, not a good solution for random I.O. 
And so for the last year, we spent a lot of time, uh, because we were working on the QMU integration, we also thought, well, since we're going to do that, let's also work on the Cinder integration. Let's implement Gluster Protocol support within Cinder directly. Let's, let's get the Nova support integration going um, and make use of the great work that we were doing uh, on the other layers of the stack. And a lot of that is thanks to the gentleman to my left uh, and who will describe in detail what he did uh, with the Cinder drivers. If you look at, um, in the previous release, release in the Grizzly, Grizzly was the first OpenStack release that featured uh, uh, Gluster support in Cinder, but it was still using the fuse mount. It was not going to LibGF API, and that's because uh, Grizzly was released before we released LibGF API. Uh, and it was, I think it was, at first it was geared for GlusterFS 3.3, and then since then we released 3.4. Um, but the, the Glance and Cinder integration were both via the, the, the fuse, the, the GlusterFS client mount. Uh, fast forward to Havana, and that has changed because uh, by the time Havana was released, we had released GlusterFS 3.4, which included the QMU integration, and we wanted to make sure that the new release of OpenStack could utilize the, the new uh, QMU integration. So the Cinder integration was, was built out a bit further uh, to expand the support, uh, and we had the Nova integration, which allowed uh, Cinder to make use of the, the QMU uh, integration. Also with Havana, we we finished a lot of the collaboration that we were doing with the, with the Swift client upstream uh, to make it more compatible with what we were using. Previously, like for the beginning two years ago, we, we kept a series of patches against the Swift release, and so it was a real pain to carry those patches forward to every new release. And so we thought, well, that's a really stupid way to do it. So we worked a lot more closely with the Swift project, and I'm, I'm proud to say that collaboration is bearing fruit for both parties. So it's a, it's a vote for open, uh, open source collaboration. Um, Glance integration, thanks to a lot of the, uh, the new features that have come out with Havana, we don't have to do a lot as far as uh, Glance integration. A lot of that is handled through the, via the Cinder driver now, since um, with Havana, I think the uh, Glance can point to the, the same location as Cinder. Um, and then Nova integration. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we now have Nova integration with, uh, with the Havana release, uh, which does make use of the, the work that we did with the KVM, uh, the KVM and LibGF API integration. Uh, as I mentioned, we've, we've been very, very happy with the results of all the work that we've done with the Swift project and the Swift developers. Uh, it's been, uh, it's, it's been uh, useful for both parties. Um, and we've, we've, we've spent a lot of time working with them to make Swift pluggable, not just for GlusterFS, but also for other storage backends, so that, you know, so that we're all can, we can all become Swift API advocates, uh, and there can be multiple implementations of Swift, and then you use the one that's, you know, best for your use, particular use case. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, we have, we have two contributors now to the, uh, the Swift project, two committers. Oh, wait, is this? Oh, here, sorry. Uh, so why would you do this? Uh, well, I mean, there are a variety of reasons. Um, it's, it's still really early days yet when you start talking about the open source, you know, software-defined storage backends for uh, virtual machine management we, for, uh, for object storage. Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done yet, but we think we're at a point now where we can start going forward with real world use cases, which I'll get to at the very end, uh, at least one in particular. And we think it's ready for a bit more uh, usage from the general audience that for people who want to check it out, I think it can be useful for uh, several workloads now as opposed to previously where I would really only recommend it for one. Um, but in general, you, you want to look at our, our modularity, our extensible architecture, the fact that you can add new features via our Translator API or via our LibJF API uh, client library if you want to uh, uh, integrate with, with your particular uh, software. Uh, you, you have multiple choices of transport. You're not just limited to IP. You can also use our DMA. Uh, data locality, which came in handy when uh, we implemented the HDFS uh, API uh, on GlusterFS. And then uh, the fact that it's transparent, no matter, you know, you can run applications on your storage servers, so you can have the whole storage resident application thing going. Uh, and it's easy to manage and maintain. We, we pride ourselves on the fact that GlusterFS is the easiest to install and get running of any of the distri distributed file systems. In about four commands, you can have a cluster of four machines running uh, a distributed, replicated uh, Gluster volume. And I'm gonna turn over to you uh, Mr. Harney, the gentleman to my left. Any questions about this so far? Yes. Uh, 
the root file system for the virtual machine is mounted from some cluster volume. Is that what you mean? You can do this with Cinder boot from volume. Um, so if you're using the Cinder cluster FS driver, the standard boot from volume support will give you that ability. By default, I'm not sure what the distinction is yeah. there. Um, sorry, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Eric Harney, who will go through uh, some of the details of the uh, implementation. Are you Mike? Oh, yeah, sure. um, yeah. So this is about the ClusterFS Cinder integration. Um, we have a Cinder ClusterFS volume driver it's initially added in Grizzly with um, basic functionality for creating, attaching volumes. Um, Havana has added a number of features, um, primarily snapshot support for Cinder volume snapshots, as well as the ability to clone Cinder volumes, um, copy to and from glance images, and uh, the new Cinder extend volume operation. Um, so this is kind of now a more robust, full-featured Cinder volume driver that um, is comparable to most of the other ones in Cinder. I'm going to go over. Uh, kind of a summary of how snapshotting actually works. So for clarity here, uh, sender volume versus cluster volume, there's, this is kind of a many to one relationship. So a cluster share can host any number of sender volumes as a, a sender, a sender cluster volume is a file on a sender share. And so when we create a snapshot, we are using QCAL2 external snapshots which basically means you get an additional file that contains your snapshot delta. Um, for each snapshot you create, when you delete them, the snapshot is merged into its backing parent in the snapshot chain. Um, wh one reason this is a little bit different from a lot of sender drivers is that this being a, a file-based solution, we coordinate with Nova to create and delete snapshots in the um, while the VM is running, rather than having the storage backend just do it itself. Um, so when you create a, a sender GlusterFS snapshot, it actually coordinates through Nova and tells Libvirt and QEMU to create a snapshot and handle the manipulation <coughs> of the, the snapshot chain. Um, so Havana, as John Mark had mentioned, we also added libgf API support to Nova. You basically just turn on this one option in Nova and whenever you attach a sender volume, it will use libgf API to connect to your sender GlusterFS volume um, so you can get the QEMU performance benefits that he had described. Uh, the, the main limitation of this at the moment is that we still need work done to support libgf API with the sender volume snapshots. So for the moment, this is only for um, full sender volume um, without snapshots that you can use libgf API. Um, 
since since we're coordinating with Nova, um, no no other sender driver currently really works this way. Um, but what we can do is, since we're having Libvirt and QEMU handle snapshot creation for us, is going forward we want to leverage some of the QEMU guest agent capabilities that have recently been added to Nova to try to drive toward guest quiescing for sender volume snapshots. And that's something I'm going to be looking at um, in the near future. And the, <coughs> the other primary sender feature that I want to still add to the GlusterFS driver is uh, the ability to back up GlusterFS backed sender volumes. For, for those of you that have looked at um, RDO or Packstack on any Fedora or Red Hat kind of setup, it has options built in to um, set this up for you. You can basically just set a couple of options. As long as you have the required versions of QEMU and GlusterFS, which are present in Fedora and coming in uh, RHEL 6.5, I believe, um, this will basically set up Cinder GlusterFS integration for you out of the box as a deployment option. Um, and this is, for any developers, there's a, there's a comparable set of options in DevStack that also will um, handle the same kind of deployment and configuration for you. So I'm gonna let uh, John Mark talk about Swift deployment a little more. So as I mentioned, the goal is to have um, the same Swift client for, for everything, for whether you're talking about deploying Swift, uh, the traditional Swift deployment, or, or one GlusterFS. Um, but I think with, uh, as of Havana, you still have to install the, uh, the Gluster Swift uh, package if you want to make use of the Swift API with GlusterFS. Um, I'm thinking that should change for Icehouse, but I want to confirm that before I can say for sure. Um, but again, like I mentioned, we are working upstream with the Swift community to, to uh, enhance the pluggability uh, of the Swift client, the Swift, the Swift API and the, the Swift uh, proxy server. Um, and then also, uh, one thing to understand, at least for now, um, when you deploy Gluster Swift, there is one Gluster volume per tenant, meaning that when you map out, um, I think on the, let me go back to the previous slide where I showed the diagram. Um, no, not that one. Yeah, this one. Um, when you look at the way we map the, uh, uh, the Swift API to GlusterFS, uh, account container object gets mapped to volume, directory, and file. So a single tenant goes to a single volume. Uh, we know that going forward, that's not um, something we'll continue. So we're going to change that. We just have to figure out the implementation, yeah, implementation details of how we go about that. Uh, moving right along. Um, So on the roadmap, uh, you know, what's in the future? I've, I've kind of told you what's, what you can do now, but what, what's coming up? And I'm very excited about a project to implement uh, files as a service uh, within the OpenStack Camp Pantheon. Uh, right now it's codenamed Manila. Uh, there are a bunch of engineers from NetApp and Red Hat uh, working on this, and I think a few other companies. I'm not entirely sure who all is working on it. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking that one of the, in the design summit, they're trying to uh, make it, uh, uh, trying to incubate it for the ISAS release. I don't know the status of that. Um, do you want to say something about the status of that, or is there anything to report there? Stand up. A uh, lot more uh, NAS vendors and uh, uh, distributed storage systems, including SAF, are interested in this project. So uh, we, we would have to figure out what happens on the 19th. Okay. So, so the status is we don't know yet if it's incubated for Ice House, but okay, fair enough. Um, but yeah, the, the whole point is to provide you know, multi-tenant file sharing uh, in an OpenStack context uh, so you can just load uh, uh, you know, file servers on the go you know, for, for each tenant. Um, and you can see the, the URL there for more details. Uh, I think there's actually some code that, that, that works. Um, I'm not entirely really sure where they are in, in terms of implementation or, or how well it works, but uh, it's something that is certainly worth checking out. And it's something we're very excited about, something very, we're very excited to be contributing to uh, and to be uh, taking some leadership on. And 
that same vein, as far as incubating projects goes, there's Savannah. Um, how many of you actually use Hadoop for anything? I just want to, okay, fair enough. Um, but it's a collaboration between, uh, between Red Hat, uh, Mirantis, and Hortonworks to make uh, Hadoop uh, be able to scale out uh, with OpenStack, or using OpenStack to scale out uh, uh, Hadoop uh, deployments. Um, this kind of gives you a basic diagram. I don't want to go into too much detail here, but, um, but it, the ability to spin up Hadoop, Hadoop, Hadoop clusters on demand uh, is a really nice feature to have, and it's something that, you know, if you're an Amazon user, you, you have the benefit of Elastic MapReduce. And this is, a, um, this is uh, an attempt to recreate the, the EMR experience uh, in an OpenStack context. I think it'd be a very powerful thing going forward and sort of shows the flexibility of OpenStack as an app deployment uh, environment and you know, for more things than just simply uh, spinning up VMs in a cloud. Uh, then I wanted to go into kind of real world usage. There are, in fact, uh, today, uh, there are people using uh, GlusterFS uh, with uh, an OpenStack integration. And the one I want to highlight is Amadeus. Uh, Amadeus is, and I didn't know this, I didn't know who Amadeus was until I uh, understood they're using the Gluster Swift in integration. But they're a large travel website, uh, apparently very well known globally, uh, but not in American audiences. Um, but they are, they are, uh, they're deploying GlusterFest, they're using the, uh, the Swift integration that we did. Um, one of the, there are many reasons that they, they went this route. Uh, one of them is sort of the ability to, the mapping between the, the metadata that you store with an object and how that goes into the extended attributes of the file side. So that when you're accessing the data, either over a, a POSIX mount or a, or a object storage layer, uh, you're, you're getting at the, the different, you could, you're still able to access the, the metadata that gets stored in the extended attributes. Um, the co-location with other, and with other local workloads. This gets back to the, it, for them, the, the no data silos uh, detail, the uh, design uh, principle that we follow is very important to them. Uh, it's something that, it allows them to make data available via the Swift API as well as over a POSIX mount, uh, and you can access it either way. That's, uh, that's something that they was very, uh, one of the reasons why they chose this solution. Um, and they've been using uh, this since the Grizzle release, and they've been uh, looking at exploring other ways to utilize uh, GlusterFS integrated with uh, other pieces of, of OpenStack. Yeah, okay. And I'm gonna wrap it up now. Uh, just one final thing I wanted to show you. If you want to, start or look at some integration projects in the Gluster community uh, or one or with GlusterFS, go to the Gluster Forge. We have a lot of interesting things there that you can find. Um, and it's, it is the central clearinghouse for, for developers and users of, of OpenStack of, of, of uh, Gluster software. Thank you. Do we have time for questions or? You know what, I, I didn't realize that we had actually gone past the uh, allotted time. I thought it was 9.50, but apparently it's 9.40. I apologize, So, but if you want to talk to me um, uh, outside, I'm happy to, to talk to you. I, I apologize, I didn't realize that we, were, we had gone past time. Thank you. <laughs>